All right. Well, good day, everybody, and welcome to another week of Creation Conversations. Um, John Mackay is not actually able to be with us this week. He is, in fact, leading a uh, men's breakfast devotional in South Australia at the moment. Um, he's been able to get out and uh, and go and travel and do some ministry, which is a great thing. But we do have a special guest with us here this evening, this morning, this afternoon, wherever it is around the world. We have Craig Hawkins with us um, from the Creation Discovery Centre in Tasmania. It's really good to have you here, Craig. Yeah, great to be here, Joseph. So, um, Welcome. You're the uh, you run a sort of a let's just sort of find out a little bit about you first, um, because uh, in case some of our, our viewers haven't uh, heard of you before, or know your association with creation research. So, um, do you want to start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Because I believe you have something to do with sea life and seahorses as well. Yeah, well, I do now. Uh, we run, run the Seahorse World Tourism Facility um, and and Seahorse Farm. We breed seahorses. Uh, we've sent them all around the world. We've sent them to the UK in the past and, and many uh, big public aquariums around the world uh, display our seahorses. Uh, but before that, I was a, a professional forester and uh, had done my forestry degree at the Australian National University in Canberra. Uh, my wife is a, a biologist and aquaculturalist, having started at the seahorse farm as the biologist. And then uh, when we purchased the farm, uh, with God's leading, we um, had to make a decision and I left forestry and, yeah, started to, to manage the facility. Now, I visited the um, the Seahorse facility that, uh, that you and your wife run a few years back in, or it would have been 2018, I think it was, when I was over in Australia. And I just found it fascinating seeing all of the, the, the tanks full of seahorses. And it's not just seahorses, is it? You've got other things. Like I, I remember there was a, a sea dragon there and the starfish and stuff that people could come and come and visit as well. So it was a real fascinating tour to actually get around and get up close and personal to all of the to all of the animals that was that was really very wonderful um but it's not just it's not just the the seahorses and the sea life and stuff like that um we're obviously here today mostly to talk about the creation discovery center um which when i visited in 2018 it was still sort of uh, halfway to being built there was uh, lots of uh, projects going on there so just tell us a little bit about the background of the Creation Discovery Centre and how it sort of came to be, because I understand it's been a few years in the making. Yeah, well, it's been a slow uh, process, largely because we're busy people working. Uh, we had to build up some funds, of course, to to make it operational and, and find space. So mm -hmm. originally we weren't going to start it where we've got it now, but actually an area that we already lease next to seahorse world became available and um and bit by bit uh you know we we're able to get displays together and cabinets together and that we discussed it with john he was he was on board and very su supportive from the very earliest stages and um, it was great to get some of his magnificent fossils which some of which we're going to look at today excellent Oh, it's really that's it's really good. So uh, bit by bit, it sort of started to come together and started to sort of uh, build and, and and design it. So um, has there has there been a is there a lot, a lot group of people who support it and sort of work together? Is it just just you? How does it all sort of uh, run? Well, we had a, a passion many years ago in the early days of our marriage, both being scientists to to somehow get across to a dying world that you know we have a loving god that made us and um, this is a you know we've seen in our our lives with the people we mix with it it's uh evolution is a real blockage for them uh meeting the lord jesus and uh and we wanted to get something happening and we we came across another couple in our local area that um had the same passion from a different sort of angle um brendan and diane foley and we started to meet together and develop plans and uh, form an association and, and so on and so on. And, you know, um, John Mackay was right there with us as a, a partnering with us and gave us great support and encouraged us to finally get the museum over the line. 
get it going. I think I've actually got a picture up here. You've sent several pictures of the museum and some of the work that you've been doing. Um, I believe this is uh, yourself and your your wife there on the uh, left hand side of the screen. Um, and obviously, I'm assuming that is that the Foley's on the right hand side with John in the back. Yeah. There There's our international director, John, at the back. So uh, our viewers will recognise him. He's normally he's normally on here having this this chat, but that's that's a pretty cool display you've got going on behind there as well. Is that the the new Noah's flood display? Yeah, that's the introductory huh. um, panel that you come across as you go into the display. Um, just giving background, we're, we're focusing on Noah's flood in this particular um, exhibition simply because you know it's not big enough to cover every creation issue, <laughs> and and hopefully we'll grow in time. Maybe in a few years we'll move into bigger premises. Absolutely, yeah. So I've got a few photos up here of the um, of the, the the display, specifically looking at the Noah's flood and uh, the ark and stuff like that. So, um, would you like to to sort of uh, tell us a little bit about some of the things that you have on display in the sort of Noah's flood section? Yeah. Okay. So this this introductory panel that's from a different angle uh, to the one we were just looking at, but um, yeah, just to to welcome people and and highlight that. Many scientists over the years uh, have come from a creation uh, background, and in fact, you know, a great deal of the, the sciences have been established by creation-believing scientists. Uh, we talk about worldview and and how the um, you know the biblical worldview is is quite different to the evolutionary mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Things are getting worse, not better. Uh, and then, yeah, then. Charles Darwin and Charles Lyell, how they they change things and the way the scientific world uh, views views the majority of things. There they are. Um, the present is the key to the past is what Charles Lyell introduced, and it's been very effective. And, and this was a a real key point for me when I listened to John Mackay's lecture um, many years ago, and he raised this, and I thought, yes, that is the way we we're taught to, to think without even really realising it. And so it's great to bust that myth that that the present is not the key to the past. The past and history as presented in the Bible is the key to what we see now. To the present. It's it's completely the opposite way of thinking, really, to the to the biblical mm. way. The Bible says, look, what happened in the past, you know, uh, creation, mankind, sin, the judgment of God, that explains the situation that we're in today. It's the past that's the key to the present, and it's uh, Jesus Christ coming as our saviour, which is the key to, to eternal life in the present. It's the past that's the key to the present. So this whole sort of philosophy um of the present being the key to the past the thing which is really the foundations of geology is completely flipped on its head from the, the biblical perspective and something that i found i mean this is like i say this is i first sort of started hearing this from john and um it sort of amazed me as well and it's a revolutionary sort of uh, concept to me at the time and something that i found out going back even deeper is how seep this sort of idea of present being the key to the past this idea of deep time sort of how seeped in pagan ideology it actually is because if you if you follow it back um the only reason that charles darwin was able to sort of promote his idea of evolution or his version of evolution because he certainly didn't come up with the idea uh, was because of charles lyell's promotion of millions of years in a deep time scale and he got his ideas from james hutton another scotsman who published them a bit earlier in the 1700s and he got his ideas from the french revolutionaries people like voltaire and buffon and you see what's interesting at the time you had a situation in France very similar to the monarchy in England, where the idea was the monarchy had been appointed by God, that the monarchy was a divine uh, appointment of God, therefore you couldn't question the monarchy. And of course, if you're a French revolutionary, you're not too keen on that idea. So you're trying to find a way to explain things naturally. And so what they actually did was borrow from the much earlier Greek ideas of naturalism and evolution and millions of years, which were themselves based on the old Hindu and Babylonian ideas of deep time and ancient time, which all began with the rejection of scripture. So it's amazing how far this has sort of been influenced down through history and how it's become the basis of of, of modern geology so it's a really good I, I really like the way that you've started 
um, with this sort of foundational uh, issue, really, to sort of really destroy the foundations of of the whole sort of evolutionary um, way of thinking. So that's a that's a really really great point, a really great display. So is this the main museum looking down in it? Yeah, so that's the main display room as as we've set it up so far. So you know, there's various fossil cabinets and um, dis uh, you know one or two design displays. Mm -hmm. We've got a stalactite generator and around the corner we've got a, a small uh, theaterette as well uh-huh there is there yeah as well um there we go it's just a little eight seat theaterette we've got a fantastic um film by carl werner playing mm -hmm. and uh, any film we want to play really of course creation research has got some fantastic videos that we can play there as well Excellent. That's some great stuff. So I've, I've noticed here you've got this picture here. I mean, what's what's going on here, Craig? What's all this about? Oh, okay. So that's that's a megalodon tooth, uh -huh. and behind it we have the jaw of a great white shark. Oh so, wow! Okay, so that, that's that's just the tooth on its own in the middle there. That that black thing. That's that's just the tooth. That's just the tooth, and it's a giant tooth. But sharks are identifiable by their teeth and uh, we can be very confident that the megalodon is basically a massive great white shark because of the similar similarity of the teeth now that jaw that's in the background you're not allowed to get great white shark jaws anymore it's it's actually against the law but this is one that we uh, got quite a few years ago from an old fisherman in tasmania who had found a great white shark caught up in nets he was already dead and um he he cut the the jaw out but he also it was a three and a half meter great white shark and he cut the liver out and weighed it and it was a hundred kilos 100, 100 wow. kilograms so it was massive he heavier than than my entire weight so um you know it was it was a large shark at three and a half meters but a megalodon can get to 20 meters so that's, one can imagine how massive they really were that's a big shark that's a, a really really big shark yeah this is another one of your your pictures for me so what you're saying here then we've got clear evidence of of of, of change i mean um, if a, a great white shark and a megalodon we can tell from their teeth they're pretty much the same creature more or less um so there's definitely been change because megalodon used to be 20 to you know 25 meters in length huge great big giant shark nowadays they're you know i mean your example was uh, you know nearly between three and four meters in length they can get up to a wife well, it's great white shark it's about six meters in length is the biggest something something like that so there's definitely that's been right, change yeah. here they've gone from really really big to little but would you say that that's evolution Hold on, we've lost you a moment there, Craig. I think you've uh, you're frozen a little bit. I'm getting notifications that your internet connection is quite low. Oh, hang on, I think you're back with us. I'm back. There we go. You're back now. That's great. Um, yeah. So we're saying we've got a great big shark change to a little shark now. Um, the big ones appear to be extinct. So there's definite change there. But would you say that that was evolution? That change? No, most certainly not. It's it's quite clearly devolution. And uh, we see this with quite a few animals. Uh, the sharks and the, the crocodiles, for example, are, are creatures we know that the bigger they are, generally the older they are. Hmm. And so the question is, well, what sort of world were they in? And it must have been a different world to what we see now. Uh, it must have been a better world. And so the, the great the great whites or the megalodons, as we know them, the bigger ones, must have been living in a fantastic world. Really good the environment. Best food and the best environment for them. And, uh, and that's not what we see now. So the great whites are not growing to the sizes that they were capable of, of previously. And, and that's why the past tells us more about where we've come from than what we were saying before. The present doesn't really tell us much much at all about the megalodons so the great white sharks aren't getting as big as they were and we've also it looks like the crocodilians aren't as well and this isn't the only example i know we've got of a of a giant crocodile skull but this is one that's in the creation discovery center in tasmania um so 
there's definite change going on, but it's it's not evolution. Evolution says you start down here, you know, in the slime, and you build your you build your way up. You gain information. You get bigger. You get better. But what we're seeing here, it's definitely changed. There's no doubt about it. But what we're seeing is that creatures started up here, and they've been going downhill which of course fits perfectly with the Bible, um, which says that in the beginning, everything was very good. And then mankind sinned and everything else has been going downwards ever since. So um, it, it's fantastic that the museum there is, is displaying great evidence uh, of the Bible's history, version of history actually being true. Things are going, going downhill and they're going downhill very, very rapidly indeed. Um, I've seen this other picture we've got here. This is, uh, I'm assuming, a, a, a model of Noah's Ark. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's one, and and um, uh, you know, to scale, many people are quite shocked. In in fact, we've had a, a number of people that have come into our centre simply just wanting to see uh, the model. Uh, they just wanted to get an idea of how it was possible to fit in all of the animals, and uh, uh, that really helps visual, a lot of people yeah. get an idea. That's fabulous. Well, there's uh, there's another thing which I'd I'd like to talk about very briefly because you mentioned it a little bit earlier, and this is something that was actually going on e e when I visited before the museum was even open, which was the the stalactite making machine that you mentioned earlier. Um, I think we've got a, f a a picture or two and even a video here. Um, here's a picture. Can you just sort of uh, give us a brief a brief synopsis of what's going on here and 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 what what what's sort of happening with this with this machine? Okay, so this is one of uh, John Mackay's uh, fantastic ideas where we've got a bunch of abalone shells crushed up inside a barrel and uh, a little bit of cement mixed there and then we've put just dead ve vegetation over the top. We've done those layerings twice and then uh, filled the barrel with water and there's a wick that goes down through the whole lot and comes out the bottom. So you can just see the end of the wick sticking that's out just the end of the wick that we're looking at there yeah okay that's correct and the water drips down through those and we have a, a stalactite starting to form that one that you're looking at there is only about 20 days old so about three weeks and you can see it starting to form the stalactite all, already just with the constant dripping um, and we believe there's bacterial action yeah, from, from microbes in the vegetation that is impacting the, the development of this start top. Yeah, because from, from a geologist's perspective, um, creating things like, you know, splenotherms is the, is the technical word they use, like stalactites and stalagmites and the sort of the, the cave formations, um, they're, they're from calcium carbonate or limestone. But what's really interesting, well, there's, there's, there's twofold. The first thing is, from a geologist's perspective, specifically a secular geologist's perspective, these things are supposed to take hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of years to actually form. Um, the formation is supposed to be a fraction of a millimetre per year. It's supposed to be a very, very slow process. And so one of the biggest arguments that we've come across, me, both myself and, and John, as geologists who believe in the Bible, is secular geologists saying, well, there's no way that the Bible could be true because the Bible clearly um, says that the Earth is around six to 10,000 years old, yet we have these cave formations which are a few hundred thousand years old at the absolute minimum. Minimum. So there's no way that the Bible could actually be true. And the other interesting thing about it is it appears that if you just have water and limestone, it does take a huge amount of time to actually dissolve the limestone and then redeposit it as a hanging stalactite because water is a not a great you know limestone really doesn't dissolve in water very easily you have to actually have a, some kind of a chemical process in order to get it to dissolve in water so that it can then redeposit as a stalactite so it would seem that just water on its own it would take hundreds of thousands if not millions of years to form a stalactite um but what we found fascinating and what i found particularly fascinating about your little sort of uh portable ones because john mckay has made these huge great big troughs which are quite impractical in <laughs> shifting around and actually putting on display um but there's this element of the uh, the bacteria the the mulch and the decaying leaves and vegetation that you've got into it which does seem to indicate that there's a biological chemical process um actually speeding up the 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 the, the 
dissolving of the limestone and then redepositing it as a as a stalactite so i mean this was uh, sort of 20 days old how is your stalactite getting on now well well that was only taken uh, yesterday in fact that photo so that that's young we, we've had others going in the past but yeah. um neglect as we were slow to develop the museum um, meant that they sort of stopped but okay. we do have um i think we had a picture there of of one that was brought in from if you got that there joseph uh, just having a, having a look and see an, an industrial site nearby no not that one sorry did i not include it no, i don't I think i don't think i've got it oh, i don't think yeah. i've got it here 16 16.1 16 if, if you've got it there um but anyway um yeah and that one's you know a foot long and it and the workers said it could only possibly have developed in the last uh, in the two years before it was collected so you know you can you can develop stalactites of, of quite a reasonable size yeah in yeah. a pretty short period of time yeah, I remember when I was uh, when I was uh, at the centre in two thousand and eighteen. I think it was something like about that big. One of the ones that you had going, you had going before, and that was only a, a few months old. I think on average, it depends on the temperature and stuff. But I think on average, it's about uh, it can be up to a, a centimeters growth each each month if if the if the conditions are right. So it's certainly a much 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 quicker process um, than you know or it can be a much quicker process than sort of conventional geology um would, would would dictate and i think that's the key as well it's the process you get the process right and it can happen very very quickly well we've got just under 10 more minutes um to chat on today's creation conversation so shall we move on to some fossils uh, that you've got on display we sort of looked at some of the different um uh, sort of bigger displays and and some of your uh change in animals and, and and the like but we've got a few a few great fossils here um let's just bring bring this one up in particular i quite like the look of this one um what's going on here craig so um well if you can just go back to the previous one the 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 scallops a little this bit different one, this one here yeah well that these are bryozoans and 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 uh, uh -huh. there's branching bryos that's a fenestella I, I believe and and these are marine marine fossils from a quarry in the center of tasmania at about an elevation of over 700 meters i'm not sure if you had the map there of where we are in I tasmania but just here there we go yeah you've got that one there That's there we go there. there we are yep so this is the bottom site site one there from from near lake sorrel mm -hmm. in the center of Holland, an area i worked in in forestry here in tasmania and uh, there was a quarry that uh, a lot of these fossils were just um, used to to spread across the road. So you can drive around gravel roads in that area and there's just tens and tens of thousands mm -hmm. of marine fossils of all sorts uh, from this area. And, um, and, you know, it's quite interesting. Tasmania's got lots of fossil sites. We're starting to build up our, our information on that. Uh, the site above it on the coast, you can see site two at St Mary's. Um, that's the, the scallop fossil area, if you'd like to bring that one up, Joseph. That's, uh, oops, not that one. That's this one here, yeah? That's this one here. So we've got a, a cabinet display um, sh sh of living fossils, just mm -hmm. showing how if the world is supposedly millions of years old, um, why are there so many creatures that we see now unchanged from the fossil record? Mm -hmm. In fact, every major group of plants and animals on the planet alive today are basically having examples of um, being unchanged in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. So he is clearly a scallop and it's very powerful to show these things next to each other. I think we've got another one here's, we can here's show. A, here's, here's another example, yeah, the, the fossil Nautilus. This, this is one of my favourites. Uh, you know, it's supposedly up to 500 million years old. That's just an incredible amount of time. Mm. And yet here we have a modern Nautilus. These are now actually on the CITES list, which is the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species. So they're going backwards. Um, the Nautilus 
various types of nautilus uh, um, have become extinct and even the modern nautilus is in trouble so um, it, it's unchanged uh, evolution hasn't helped it in in the present world it's in decline and um, it's unchanged it's just, just incredible like, just like this one as well the uh, the pipefish i love this fossil i remember seeing this when i was over there it's absolutely fantastic yeah this is a brilliant one so um john john uh, presented us with this one as a gift uh, quite a few years ago mm -hmm. and the alligator pipefish is one that you know that's one that we was once on display here and uh <laughs> came to its end but it, it's just amazing it's a, it's about the same length almost exactly it's uh, very similar looking and ve very little difference whatsoever it is a it is a very 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 beautiful very beautiful fossil yeah absolutely uh, and uh, this example as well the, the starfish the same it's the same thing um and, the, and i think living fossils give a, a really powerful bit of evidence that wherever you go in the fossil record because ultimately the fossil record is supposed to be the ultimate proof of evolution right if you want to prove evolution you need to go to the fossil record because that's a record of history past history uh, of life on of life on earth whereas when you actually go to the fossil record um what you are what you find is is one of three things creatures have either remained exactly the same like the living fossils nautilus hasn't changed uh, starfish hasn't changed pipefish hasn't changed you find that they have changed but they have not evolved they've devolved uh, like the megalodon shark that you've got on display like the uh, uh the, the crocodilians that you've got on display or creatures have gone extinct like the dinosaurs and not one of those three things is any help to evolution in the slightest um, no. and, and that's that's all that you that's all that you find in the fossil record so there's some really really great uh, great displays there um let's just bring up one or two more um photos oh by the way uh craig you might be uh might be interested john mckay has uh, has shown up as well um he's uh packing up and getting ready to go go right now so <laughs> he's 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 decided to uh to pop in and say hi um but do you want to just explain to us what's going on here in this picture okay well this this is in our catastrophic flood deposits uh, cabinet uh, just demonstrating how the geology and the fossils just reveal this catastrophic sort of event that's happened um mm. here we have land plants and the arrow there is pointing to a fish so i don't know of too many people that see fish swimming around in the forest but <laughs> they certainly have died together in this instance and so the only thing that's really going to do that is some sort of uh, catastrophic event that you know brings fish and plants into the one jumbled mess and uh, so just yeah, to clarify the the plants are the are the lighter sort of almost white things on this on this block is that right yes and and the yeah. far one on the far left hand side is is actually wallamai pine okay uh, when it was discovered up up near our home area in new south wales uh it it, it had been thought to be extinct and and a and a, and a creature or plant that lived in the dinosaur era so it's like it was like finding a dinosaur living on the planet today wow. in in the plant world and um and people were amazed but there's there's a grove of it in in a deep gorge in the very wild wilderness areas west of sydney so a very real living fossil and one that was pretty yeah. thought to be extinct fantastic all right well we're, we're just about out of time let's talk about one last thing because i believe you have a fossil with you today oh okay yes so we've got this big lump of rock and uh, we got big this from um the tamar river just oh. down there i'm going to put this up and see if you can see oh have i got it there oh, i've gone the wrong way <laughs> there we I go i can just about see where the arrow is there we go yeah that are ah, that sort of dark little uh long thing pointing where the arrow is that's 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 a is that a fossil leaf of some description that's exactly what it is it's oh, a leaf okay. fantastic i think we've now, got a photo of it as well let's put that up on the screen so people be a little bit easier to see there we go. it's a bunch of leaves really there and this is in rocks where we also collected a lot of mussels in fact there's a mussel okay. embedded deep in this rock which we won't look at just now but um 
this again is is mass uh, plant material, land plants mixed with sea creatures, which is pointing yet again to you know catastrophism and how the past is the key to the present, not the other way around. And and it very much looks like a eucalypt leaf. So let me put this one up there. So okay, very so much. There's the, there's the eucalypt leaf that you can see there, and there's the leaf itself. So yeah that looks that looks absolutely identical that's fantastic that's really good so another so living fossil unchanged unchanged from the fossil fantastic. record fantastic well craig we're going to have to call it to a close it's been absolutely fantastic to have you uh, with us and would love to have you with us again and uh, maybe next time we could talk about seahorses and have a look around your uh, your site for people who want to find out more about the creation discovery center you can go to creationdiscoverycenter.com um, a warning to our american viewers um center is spelled the correct way here uh you spell it slightly differently so make sure you get the right spelling when you're typing it in creationdiscoverycenter.com uh, and you can find out more and of course if anybody is in tasmania or is going to visit tasmania do make sure that you pop in and say hi to craig and the team down there as well and uh, this is sort of going to be one of uh, of many uh, creation conversations we're going to be discussing about creation discovery centers hopefully uh, and our museum project that we have going on all around the world um so hopefully next time we can uh, actually have john mckay and talk to him about jurassic arc so craig thank you very much it's been absolutely wonderful Goodbye, God bless, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Joseph, and bye to everyone.